And we'd like to begin with the hardest questions of all. Who are you? I don't know. Let me know if, you know, if, you, if I find out. <laughs> Peter Bogdanovich. Do you remember what year or what, about what time in your life you met Jonas? It was in the 50s, late 50s, I would say. I'm, I'm measuring that by the fact that when I did the first play I directed, uh, was the first or second? No, it was the first play I directed uh, in New York, off Broadway. It was a play by Clifford Odets called The Big Knife, about Hollywood, actually. And um, the reason I remember that it was that was a 59 60 season. And J Jonas came to, to see it. And that's where I met him, I think. He came to the theater and saw the production, which he liked. And I, met, I think that's what we met, which would have been late sixty, late fifty nine, or early or early sixty, huh? How did he hear about it? Do you, do you know? It was upstate, right? Then later on, uh, about a year or so later, I did um, four plays in the summer. I directed four plays, and, and I was the artistic director of a, of a, of a, of a summer theater at the Phoenician, New York, which was near Kingston, where I was born, actually. Um, but I didn't spend any time in Kingston, really, three months. Anyway. So this was Phoenicia, and I did not expect anybody to come from New York to see it, but Jonas did. He came all the way up, with, I think it was with his brother, Adolphus, and they came to see a production uh, that I did of Tennessee Williams' Camino Real, which was a complicated play to do in, in one, one two weeks rehearsal. <laughs> but anyway, it worked out fine. He came and he was so, I thought it was so sweet of him to bother to come all the way, all that way to see a, a production, which is not bad, but you know it wasn't exactly um, first rate because we didn't have any money. But it was it was, it was fine. It was good, and he was very kind and very encouraging and and encouraging me to make a movie or something. You know, just he was. That's what he was like. He was very encouraging of artists. And went all the way. I guess he liked my stuff because he. We liked each other, but he went out of his way to come up there. You know, it really touched me. He loved the medium, and he encouraged its use. In every kind of form. He wasn't uh, dictatorial about it. He wasn't. You know, he wasn't. He wasn't uh, a pain in the ass about it. He just. He, just, he wanted that to be included in, in, in the overall uh, understanding of film and what it could do and couldn't do. And he, he, he didn't, is there not, there's nothing that he, he thought it couldn't do. And that was very encouraging at that time for all young, us young guys that were just starting out, you know? You were both sort of like struggling artists in New York at that period, right? I did see him at the New Yorker Theater, which was a theater that uh, Dan Talbot renovated. There was an old theater called the York, Yorktown, I think. And I lived with my parents about three blocks away from that theater. And so I used to go to that theater quite a bit and ended up writing program notes for them and so on. And then I, I saw Jonas there quite a few times because uh, he would come to see the movie and then we'd talk afterward or so on. I remember, I don't know why this happened, but I remember standing in front of the theater, which was on Broadway in 89th, and um, somebody, we started playing around, and somebody did bang, bang, and I fell down on the sidewalk, you know. I used to do falls. Now I don't do them anymore. <laughs> and um, it, was just, it was fun hanging, hanging with Jonas. He had a great sense of humor. I think Adolphus was with him a number of times. That was it. And then we, uh, he'd come and see the movie, and uh, he, he'd talk about the movie, you know. And I remember one time, um, oh yeah, we were in the office upstairs at the New Yorker. Dan had an office up there and I would use it and see people up there sometimes. And um, so Jonas comes up there and we're talking about movies and so on. And you know, he was very much about, um, uh, for the avant-garde, this sort of avant-garde off-Broadway kind of thing. And we showed a lot of classic American, mainly American films, that, Dan, that was Dan's policy. And um, so I remember we were talking one time, and I think we put two or three people in the room, in the office, and Jonas goes over to the blackboard, and he writes, the best films are made in Hollywood. 
which he absolutely did not believe. But he did it as a gesture to me, because I was saying that all these great films made in Hollywood. So he wrote, the greatest films are all made in Hollywood. Totally for me. That's what he's like, very sweet man. But I wasn't interested particularly in, in the kind of films that he, he uh, was making in the underground. I, I think I, I applauded them because they were dedicated and so on, but I wasn't that interested in that kind of film. I was more interested in, in John Ford and Howard Hawks and, and, and Jonas indulged me in that, in that passion. You know? He didn't try to push me into um, those kind of uh, off Hollywood stuff. And I didn't try to convince him about Hollywood movies. I, I, I didn't, my position wasn't that Hollywood is better than this. It's just that it was different. And I enjoyed watching good uh, older American films. Uh, once in a while, when, when something was playing that I absolutely couldn't find anywhere else. I think I saw The Grapes of Wrath there on a double bill with Tobacco Road, two John Ford films. I think that's the best films I saw there. There was one of the Preston Sturgis. We used to go down there. I, I, I don't know if I ever went with Jonas, but we hung out. He would go see great American films. He was, he was very interested in everything. He wasn't just the avant-garde, you know. And he had a column in, in the Village Voice, which was quite influential. And he was kind of the voice of the underground movies. You know? I mean, a lot of people say you started as a film critic. Was it sort of interesting or different or unique to be a cinephile at that time? Were there, were there not a lot of people writing about films at that time? I actually started out as an actor, not as a critic. I didn't start out as a critic at all. I just started writing about movies as a way of getting in to see them for nothing. And, uh, and you know, getting invitations to see the new films and so on. But um, I started as an actor when I was 15, Traverse City, Michigan. Um, I, I acted in, I mean, it was 10 weeks, you know, and we had, to, that was where I, I started there. I'm trying to remember, if, I think Jonas might have come up. No, he didn't do it. No, that's not, not possible. No, it was, it was, uh, it was Venetia, New York, when he came to see that production of Cameron Rio. Yeah, because we, we, we were all influenced by the French. Who, who loved American films, who wrote about them as serious work, and, uh, you know, Godard and Truffaut and those guys um, really investigated the great Hollywood directors. They were, they were they, they, you know, Andy Saris was very influential. And I knew Andy, and he was a pretty good friend of mine. And Eugene Archer, who was the fourth string cri film critic at the New York Times. He was a secret auteurist, you know. The whole idea of the auteur, which is a French, French thing. And, uh, and Jonas was into that. But I, don't, I, I remember having a few conversations with him about Hollywood films, but not too many. And he didn't try to pressure me to see the avant-garde either, you know, so. We were just friendly. I, I read somewhere that film culture was the first time the auteur was written about in America. Is that true, or do you remember? I mean, the auteur theory was not a theory, first of all. It was, it was a political position statement by the French. And uh, well, it's really simple. It meant that the director was the author of the film, even if he did, didn't write it a position that writers will not necessarily agree with. But um, that whole movement started in France and, and did come over here in, in, the, in the 60s, I guess, late 50s. And Jonas was at the forefront of the idea of having an author for a movie, whether it was Hollywood or New York, you know. That all started at that period. And I don't know, film culture might have been the first sort of main, main it wasn't mainstream at all, it was pretty avant-garde, but they had, you know, they did covers of Hollywood pictures also. And I wrote for them a couple of, a few times. I heard you call film culture revolutionary. Can you tell me why? Well, it was because it, it, was, it was picking up on the French uh, idea and, um, 
it was revolutionary in the sense that they were the first ones to really talk about that, in, about the auteur theory and about uh, off Hollywood movies and so on. And it was quite influential. Yeah, it was a, a sort of like that. It picked up that idea of uh, the, the director being the author of the film and, um, and, and so on. I think I wrote a piece for the magazine about the man who shot Liberty Valance, John Ford's film with Jimmy Stewart and, and John Wayne. It wasn't a lot of money. I think he did pay me. I think I made an issue of it. I said, you got to pay me 25 bucks or something. And he did. I think I was one of the only people he paid. And then, so when the movie journal column came out, how was that different? Was he didn't really review movies so much as he kind of talked about various things. Uh, avant-garde films and so on. And sometimes personal experiences, I think. I didn't follow it um, religiously, but I, I knew, I, I knew where, where, he was, where, he, where he was going with it. It was very interesting. He was a very interesting guy, Jonas. Couldn't quite pin him down. What was his personality like? Intense, charming, very likable, he smiled easily. And, uh, and uh, precise and very, uh, uh, he had a great sense of humor. And, you know, it was a, sometimes there was a language problem because he had a thick accent and so on. I remember his brother, Adolphus, was making a film around the time we met, a little after, called Hallelujah the Hills, I think it was called. And he asked me to play a leading role in it. And I, I said, no, because it had a scene where I was supposed to run around the, the woods with a bear ass, you know? I ain't doing that. <laughs> so I turned it down. They were not happy with me, but I said, I'm not going to do that. I liked Adolphus, though. He was a nice guy. Jonas was more open. I'm, tr I'm trying to get a sense of how all of these different film movements kind of like worked off of each other and then influenced the new Hollywood. Do you think? that experimental or underground cinema was having an influence? Like guerrilla techniques that you used in targets, was that something that was new and sort of breaking boundaries from what mainstream film was doing? Well, yeah, it was it was underground, so to speak. It was Paramount distributed, distributed it. Uh, but targets was my first film, but it, was, uh, it, it wasn't really like an avant-garde film. It had Boris Karloff in it. But, but Jonas liked it and, and liked some of the way we shot it and so on. Um, you know, th there was a kind of a, a schism between the uh, off broad, off Hollywood uh, cinema and, and Hollywood. And, it, and Hollywood wasn't Hollywood anymore. <laughs> it was all very different. Um, it wasn't like the old time Hollywood where the studios were in charge. Really, the, the studios and studio system system pretty much ended in '62. Really, and um, anyway, so and the avant-garde cinema went up and then down. I don't know where it is now, but Jonas was a, was a real revolutionary. He was he wanted to break down the barriers, break down, and he was very he talked like that too. We have to take it down and break it down, and you know. Okay, take it easy, Jonas. He was, he was, I loved him though. He was so dedicated, you know, and he was real, and he was a really a nice guy and a very dedicated man and a good friend. He was a kind of real revolutionary. He was, he was ready to storm the Bastille, you know, department. He was there. He was like that. He was very, very much of a leader of the underground, you know. And he had a tremendous impact on, on those kind of filmmakers. That wasn't where I was going, but he was very encouraging to me as well. And I wasn't like that. I didn't make those kind of films. All those things, a poet, filmmaker, rabble-rouser, leader, revolutionary, a quiet revolutionary, because he wasn't noisy about it, you know. But he was kind of militant sometimes, and I rather liked that about him. No, we will do this. Right, okay. Lead on. Well, he wrote a lot of, he, he, he did a lot of, as you said, uh, 
autobiographical clips. I mean, not clips. Uh, you know, he did. He did. He was a, a revolutionary in that sense. He wanted to lead the march and give get, get respect for avant-garde films and films that aren't Hollywood and so on. And yet he recognized the brilliance of Hollywood at times, you know, for the great directors. I saw at Greg Zucker's house at an anthology preservation dinner where you were talking about the importance of film preservation in the context of all the pieces of Last Picasso show that had been lost and What's Up Doc and even some of the masks. So I wonder if you could tell, like, why is film preservation important? I mean, it was so important to Jonas. Well, because it's, it's it, if you don't preserve it, it's gone. And you know, and it has, it has a film is fragile and, and not easy to preserve, um, really. It costs a lot of money. But it is, you know, picture made in 1920 with who are Gloria Swanson and say, you want to see it and see what it was like and so on. Yeah, it's very important film, but it's history. Every film is a kind of historical document of that particular story, of that particular time, you know? Well, we both felt the same way about that. We were both kind of nutty that way, <laughs> you know? We loved uh, the history of film. We, and, and Jonas was very much of a leader in, in, in terms of the preserving films, you know? In, in that interview that you did with him, you, sa you said to him, you know, a lot of your, your titles are very melancholy. And, and that's kind of one of the things I like best about Jonas's films is like the melancholy. I, do you remember that, talking to him about that? Well, I remember that aspect of him was, was, was very dominant. He, he had a kind of bittersweet look at, it, at life. I think he'd seen a lot of tragedy back in his home country, and um, he, was, he was very much aware of, of the whole thing, as opposed to just what he was interested in. He was interested in the world and, and, uh, and where it was going, and he was kind of philosophical, and he was very philosophical and very, and you know, for English was not his first language, so he was always slightly struggling to find the right words. It was different. It was very personal. Yeah, it was, he, he had his own voice, and that contributed a lot, I think.